Hello everyone, so this talk is about debugging and troubleshooting Python applications. We'll be seeing like what are the best practices and how we can leverage the observability eventually to help us like making our processes more smoother. And I'm Neeraj, uh, I'm a software consultant and a generative artist. And I am co-founder of a, a climate management company called Vivid Climate, which we are, where we are trying to do like carbon emissions and ESG marketing and all in the Asian market. So to begin the talk, we all know like as a developer, we strive for performance and not just like a bug free code, but like continuous monitoring of systems in both monolithic and microservices applications. So let's consider like we have a new product, like we are building a new company or a new startup kind of a thing where what you're doing is like simply we're fetching some information from a banking API and then just like displaying it to the users or something. Let's, let's consider it's like the basic MVP of a product then that's gonna be a monolithic application. And over there, we'll, let's see like how we can use one of the more like the core practices that, that we can aid in maintaining the code quality, which is the logging. So we all know like logging provides a window into the operation of any kind of application. And it doesn't just like help us diagnose issues, but also understand the performance metrics. So in Python, we can simply use the robust logging module, which we can see like over here. Uh, if, for example, this is a straightforward function, which is a fetch function, which asynchronously fetches some information from the Plio API. And for example, we're taking some banking cards information from this API, we can simply call the logging.error function or logging.info by just like passing the statements or the response status. But like if we run this up, we'll get nothing. Any, any idea like why? So there's a thing like you have to do some configurations for logging in Python. And what we're doing here is like we're just like providing a version and some formatters by way we're saying like this is gonna be a logging formatters and this is gonna be a format for the date and time and name. And then we provide two handlers over here which is one is the console and one is the file handler. The console one is just doing like all the data should be coming up in a stream and should be logged out, <coughs> logged into the console that we are using. And then the another one is a file one which just takes your file, your, your output and just like saves it to the file here is like app.log. And if we just like use it and now run the function, we get the output which is something like this, which is like a pretty simple minimal like output for like it says the error, it says the info and all. The second thing is like we have log levels in Python. Like every single log level is associated with our value associated with it, like not set, debug, info and all. And what we also can do is like we can create our own log levels in Python. Like for example, we want to have something like a PyCon level, which is being associated with a value of 15, which is a little ahead of like uh, the debug value. How we can do this is like we create like a variable called PyCon level, which is which has the value of 15, a little more than the debug one, so that like it it's always ahead of debug. And then we create a new PyCon method. What it's doing, it's like, uh, it allows logging at the PyCon level. And then we just like pass it to the uh, logger function, which is the global function in Python, uh, in Python. And then we are doing the similar configurations we just did in the past slides. Like we just adding a handler, a stream handler, and then just like calling the loggers. So now what's happening is like, if we now call something like self.logger.pycon, it will log the issue at the PyCon level. And one major issue is like, we don't always want something like a plain line of logs. We also want something, a structured logs, like something which is in the format of JSON or something. So what you can use is like, there's a library called structlog, which is like quite robust in Python. And it provides you with a structured JSON formatted lo like logs for your applications. How to use it, it's like, there are like a couple of configurations you have to do. So it normally takes one of the most important, which is the processes, where are the chains of callables, and through which your log entries are processed. And what you're doing is like, we are calling the filter by level, which is gonna take all the logs by level by level, then we add the log name, then we add the log levels which we are using, 
Similarly, we're using the uh, positional arguments for matter, which is going to be formatting our entire application. And to, if it's not clear what I'm talking about, there's another slide, which is going to be, yeah. So you'll see like the positional arguments uh, for matter. What it's going to do is like, it's useful to have these placeholders, and it's going to add those placeholders to your log application, like the log files. And then we add your timestamps. And yeah, it's pretty much the same. Like you format it, you unicode, unicode it, and you just like add a JSON render, which is going to convert your log files into a JSON uh, formatted JSON file. And if you run this, uh, you get the structured logs. But the major issue is like when you're working with big applications, you have logs like this, like you have thousands of log files. But what you exactly actually want is like these logs. Like you don't, you want a specific logs. So over there, we don't prefer using something like a localized version of log files. You prefer something going as a centralized logging. You can use anything like a ELK stack or something for simplicity. I'm just using the better stack platform. Uh, you just like call the log tail handler over here. You just pass it and you just call it. It's the same thing how your logging works in Python. It just like adds all the log files in a more structured way in the uh, better stack uh, dashboard where you can get all these, uh, the file names, the function, the methods. The, it also creates your process IDs, which is unique. And yeah, it just like also tells you the log level which you're working on and the severity level. Then the second thing is like debugging. So we, we got like, we just like added some logging to applications and now what happens is like a bug came into a monolithic app like the banking app you're working on. How we can fix it? So there's a saying, there's like a famous quote by Arthur Conan Doyle, which says like, when you have eliminated the possible, whatever remains, however improbable must be the truth. So when you have eliminated most of the impossible bugs, like whatever remains, no matter what, it's gonna be the bug which is causing the issue. So a quick definition is like, um, is the identification. This is where like, I did, like all these de all our developers just like find the anomalies and bugs which might be hindering the code execution. Then we isolate the specific section and by adding the breakpoints and everything. And then we, we find the resolution. But the problem is most of the developers do debugging like this. Print, 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 print. A lot of print statements. I mean, almost everyone does that. But like the problem is like when you're working with a big function which has like thousands of nested functions just like being calling each other, it's not gonna work because it's gonna give you a file which is which looks like this, but like this is just a very simple function. But like if you have like hundreds and thousands of nested uh, like print print statements, it's gonna be a chaos. So over there, what you can use is like we can make use of the Python debuggers. So there are two types of debuggers. One is your command line and the IDB debugger. So the command line is basically P PDB, the Python debugger, which is the inbuilt in the standard library. And the IPDB, which we'll be seeing, is the interactive version of it. It can be used in your Jupyter Notebook files and all. Part B is another one, which is a graphical uh, representation of the same thing. It gives you graphs and all. And the IDB debuggers are basically more or less like platform specific. VS Code has its own debugger, PyCharm will have its own, and Wing will have its own. So how to use IPDP is pretty straightforward. You just like uh, call, import the IPDP and just like call the IPDP set trace. It will pause all the executions and allow you to inspect the current state of the program. And the, it's, the commands is gonna be pretty simple. Like you have something like a next, which is N. It's gonna continue the execution until the next line is reached and then it returns the statement. You have the continue, which continues the execution only until some sort of a breakpoint you have added has been reached. And you have quit, you just want to quit the debugger. S is like step-by-step -step execution, you just want to check. Print is gonna print, and A is another one which is gonna print all the values and the variables of that specific uh, functions or the callable. And R is basically your return, which is gonna continue the execution until the current function is returned. And if you run this, you'll see like this, this script hits the uh, breakpoint and pause the execution when you, um, when the debugger reaches the, uh, the error statement. And here in case we can see like it's the 401 error which is coming from the, uh, the Plio API, which says like, hey, we know this like 
uh, are unauthorized, maybe the bearer tokens are incorrect, and yeah, that, that's where it's gonna raise an exception, and that's how we're gonna debug our applications. Once we are done with the debugging, the major problem which we feel, which we find is like how we profile our code, wh where exactly the CPU usage is going, and what is the memory usage is happening. Because what is happening is like most of the issues are happening here because of the memory usage and all. While, de while debuggers are like um, indispensable for debugging and fixing your bugs, what we also want to do is like we also want to make sure that resource utilization is doing is, is done correctly. So this is where we'll be using the profilers in Python. So profilers are basically more or less like five functions. It it helps you find the bottlenecks, where exactly the most time is uh, being consumed, and optimization like how we can optimize our current code in production. And what are the more or less like what are the functions which are taking the maximum memory and where is this memory being allocated? The function calls is where you examine the frequency of the time spent on every single function call. And it also works with the multi threading and all. I mean, if you're working with the stacks and like the Python stacks, like continuous stacks, you might not use the debuggers or profilers. You can simply use something like PyStack. So it also it's it's the p stack, but not for lin specifically for Python. So, but we what do you look at profilers? Python has a lot of profilers, like like the the core inbuilt profilers are called C profile and the profile. But these profile has some issues. Like C profile is a robust deterministic profiler, but the problem is like it adds a decent amount of overhead to your code. Like you don't want that. And if you use the other one, the profile, it's a pure Python profiler, but the only problem is it, it has a high uh, uh, overhead when it's run. So what exactly we're looking for in profilers is like lower overhead and something is like it should not be just, fun um, it depends on the use case. It could be function based, it could be line based. So a function based profiler is basically which gives you the profiling of your entire function instead of just going line by line. and your line line profiler is basically which just just like gives you every single line like where exactly this call is happening. So we'll be talking about two major profilers here, which is um, C profile and Scalene. So C profile is something which majority of the Python developers use these days, and it's very reliable. But the only problem is like the overhead, and there's a new profiler called Scalene, which doesn't just uh, helps you find the CPU usage and all. It also helps you do the memory profiler. Because apart from this scaling, you have a memory profiler, which again adds a lot of overhead. So what's happening here is like, uh, also one more thing, like there are two types of profilers. One is called the tracing profilers, and the second one section is called the sampling one. So what is happening in the tracing profilers is like we're intercepting every single request. Uh, every single call, every single return, and exemption in your code. And what they're doing is like they're tracing the execution of every single line or a function call, either it's happening in your Python file or the native code in C. And the second one is your sampling profilers, which work by periodically checking for all your stacks in your program and at regular intervals. And instead of tracking your every single function call, because we don't want sometimes to just add an extra overhead so that we sometimes prefer sampling profilers. But the thing with scaling is like it does both. It's doing both the function base, the line base, the GPU, the CPU, the memory base, and everything. And the good thing about it is, is like the overhead it's adding, it's a little more than the, the P profile stat or the PySpy, but it's like very competitively uh, high, but like way too low than any other YAP, yet another Python profiler or profile in Python. So C profile is another built in profiler in Python, and it provides a detailed statistics on function call counts and durations. And to call it, it's pretty straightforward. You just call a C profile, and you just like let it run. Whatever you would just like, just pass the function, and it will give you the output. So if we see over here, we have an example. We have a function which called get expenses, which gets you all the expenses from the API, and you have your another function which saves those expenses to your file. And these functions are calling the helper function, which is called fetch, and the last month's date range. 
So what is happening is like one function is calling the other two functions and one helper function. So if we want to profile this code, like where exactly uh, these memory leaks and everything is happening, we can just call uh, the cprofile.run helper. This is a little different from the example I showed before, because here we are using the cprofile as a context manager kind of a fashion thing. And since Python's uh, C profile isn't inherently asynchronous, and uh, if you see, like, we have um, the function as an asynchronous function, that's why we are using the asyncio event loop here. That's why this function is like with C profile dot profile as PR, and then we just like run the helper function. And why we're doing this is like because we also want to start this. Uh, what do you call it, the profiler, and we also want to close it. So that's why in Python, if you use this, uh, uh, the context manager, it's going to give you, like behind the scenes, dot underscore, underscore, enter, underscore, underscore, exit functions, and they will start and stop the profiler on their own. And if you just like run on your command line, you will see it gives you the all the uh, cumulative time, total time, and here we are sorting it on the basis of the cumulative time. But there's one more issue with these kind of profilers is, so for example, here it's saying like the majority of the time is taken by, for example, app.py or plio.py, but that's something we don't want. We don't, we actually want like where exactly the function is those uh, extra copying is happening or extra memory is being allocated. So we'll, we'll talk about this in scaling, but like there's another tool which is like, because this is something which is very hard to understand. Like it's like you see it, you have to figure out like okay, uh, there are like fifty different calls are happening, and which one is taking what kind of what amount of time. So you can make use of a library called Sk Sk SnakeWiz, which is gonna take those adjacent for the the JSON output and just like put it into an HTML file. And if you just like run it, it will be giving you an output in a HTML file where you will be uh, you can you can just like click zoom in, zoom out, and see like, okay, Clio.file was uh, using this amount of time, and what are the native functions which are being called by this function is taking the time. And that brings us to scaling. So scaling is another Python profiler, but the only good thing is like, it doesn't just like calculate CPU, the CPU time and all, it also calculates your GPU time, the uh, memory allocations, the memory usage, and everything. And using of scaling, was a little problematic initially, but like now it's pretty straightforward. You just like call scaling your program, and what it does is like it creates two files. One is your JSON up, JSON file with all these uh, values, which uh, it calculates in real time, and another HTML file which it runs in the browser. So what's happening here is like, if you see, uh, it's doing a line profile of the functions, and it's saying like, okay, this is the amount of uh, memory it's being using. The X amount of memory is being used by the Python on your on your system, and the Y amount on the right hand side uh, it's being used by the native. The native calls it's doing your C and all, and it also gives you the memory activity, like how much memory it's being utilized by um, in this process. Another good thing is like it also now adds a feature of using the uh, GPT API. So if you just like put your uh, open this GPT four API keys. And it will automatically gives you the solutions to these um, values. Like if you find like there's a bottleneck, why this is copying so much? Why there's a memory like leak happening, or like um, it's taking a lot of memory or CPU usage? It will tell you like how to fix it as well. And one important thing, which is a quite unique thing, is like copy function, the copy feature. What it's doing is like um, if you know like in Python when you make a call, it makes a call to the uh, native uh, functions. And what's happening is like sometimes your f the way you have written your function, you just send some value, and meanwhile it's processing it. You takes it back and copy into your Python code, and then sends it back to it. So this this back and forth thing is just like copying your a lot of uh, values, which is just adding to your memory and all. So this is one thing which none of the other profilers are doing right now, and Scaling is telling you like how you can fix this as well. So it's all good, like. If we did, we did our logging, we did our um, debugging, we did our profiling, and it works very well. Like in our monolithic application, we have our payments, we have product catalog, customers, and everything. But what happens is like once you start getting a lot of customers, 
multiple people will be working on the same code base. And then what's going to happen is like it's going to be fault isolation. So if there is a single fault, it's very hard to isolate that error, and the entire application will be burned away. And the third thing is like it will be tight coupling. Like code becomes very tight coupled, and it makes very difficult to work on it. And eventually, it becomes a chaos. Like the application gets stuck. So let's say like we figure this thing out and we just move to microservices where we just like split our code based services into different services, every seven services talking to a different database. And it works fine. If you normally log it out, it works completely fine. Debug is also fine. Profiling is fine. But when these services start talking to each other, then it's an issue because traditional logging and all these things may have the capability to provide some sort of insights, but like when this kind of scenario happens, we have to go to something which is more standardized and which has a holistic understanding of the system state, like uh, the telemetry data. So that brings us to uh, something called observability. So observability is something where we use the functions or request telemetry data and then see like what's happening behind the scenes. So quickly we'll see like what are the three pillars of observability. These are the tracing, the logging, and the metrics. So the, um, the logging basically captures your discrete events. It's the same thing. Logging will be done the same way we have been doing uh, in the previous slides, which will be offering a detailed record of what exactly happened and all these uh, rich contextual informations we're getting. The second thing is your metrics, which is new for us. Like now we also want to see like what are the quantitative view of the system we are getting, like the system health, or the health checks in microservices, what are the CPU usage, uh, how we can show the aggregated data usage, error rates and all. So that's the second pillar. And to have a proper observability system, the most important is called tracing. We also want to know like what's the journey of these requests because for example, we know like a system breaks because in this functions because of this call, but we don't even know like why it's happening. So in order to understand that, we need to pass a trace in the request so that like every single step should be visible to us and we can know like what exactly is happening, what is causing the latency, the bottlenecks over there. And to use these, because if you'll see like different developers are different using different kind of backends, different kind of languages, and we use we want to use a standardized way of passing those uh, telemetry data from your applications to your backend services, like if you're using Prometheus or something like Fana where you can send your information, you, you want a standardized way. So in previously they used to be open tracing and open consensus for tracing data and your metrics data, but those just like combine into open telemetry. So it's a standardized way where you it, it allows you to use their SDKs and APIs by which you can basically instrument your entire applications uh, of the like using the hotel or OLTP, and what's happening is like they have an exporters which helps you send all the information to the backend of your choice. That's the exact thing we are looking for because we want a standardized way over here, and it's quite flexible. Like in terms of context propagation, how your values are going, be it like if you want to use something like W3C or a B3 propagation, it works with everything. And then there is a collector which sends all the values. Uh, when you send all the values to the collectors, either it's coming from your application using the SDK or it's coming from a Kubernetes uh, mesh like Istio or something. And you can you use those values from the collectors and send it to your uh, backend of choice. So to understand this, let's say this is our request. Like we have a source and it's sending a request to the service A, then it's calling service B, D, C, D, and E. And we'll see is like, every, I think every single step, the time taken is like, for example, at service A, it's taking 100 microseconds, and at B, it's 70 microseconds, milliseconds, and at C, it's like 24 milliseconds. So this is where we feel like, oh, okay, something's wrong, why it's taking so long? And eventually what happens is like, somehow it crashed. So. How we are able to see this, it's because of the spans and traces. So a span is basically, when you send a request, you have something like 
how much time it's taking and what is the next value it's being calling. So for example, if you see, there's a, there, there's a service A which is calling B, B is calling C and D, and, B, uh, and A is also calling E. So how it's, how it's working is like, span A starts, like it starts the process, it takes some X, number of, um, X amount of time, and then the span B starts, and meanwhile span B is completing, maybe it's an asynchronous call, span C starts working, and span D also starts working, and when these finishes, it comes back and span E starts to work. So these are the spans, and these are the, like, the smallest unit in our telemetry data. It could be anything, like an API call is a span, a database request is a span, so anything from the as small as a database request to anything like saving something in the cloud can be um, a span. And when you combine all these span all together, you get a trace. Like a trace is basically a collection of all your spans happening, but the only important thing is like the trace ID remains the same. It gives you a unique ID so that you can use that value <coughs> for the specific request and that's being stored in the systems and whenever something happens, you can just like look up to the trace ID and you can figure out like, okay, this is, this is exactly where my system just broke up and that's where I need to see like what's happening. So we'll see in the next slides like how we can use this telemetry data and send it to Grafana to visualize everything and see like how we can see the logs and the traces over there. And something we all just discussed is called <coughs> the context, like how these values are being spent, like the sent to the uh, to the hotel collectors. It's like you have a span ID, and every trace will have uh, every span will have its own ID, but the the trace ID will be the same for the entire spans, which is in a single request. <coughs> and then you have the parent ID, so. If a span is being, if a parent is call, if if a span is calling another one, that becomes the parent ID, the parent span, and the child becomes a child span in uh, telemetry data. And then you have the trace flags. This is just um, to add some sort of additional information about the trace. And you have the trace data, which is just vendor specific. It depends on what kind of vendor you're using, Neural Lake, uh, Grafana, or whatever you're working with. So. If you're using the OTL, like the open telemetry with Jaeger, so Jaeger is basically to help you visualize all your tracing information, you can simply uh, add the Jaeger image in your Docker file, the Docker Compose, add the ports which, are listen which will be listening to it, and the first step will be in your code will be to set up a tracing to initialize the trace providers, and then you add a Jaeger exporter, which is gonna be coming from the open telemetry SDK, so this will help us monitor and troubleshoot the microservices based distributed system we'll be using uh, to send those telemetry data. And once it's being created, uh, we have to connect the trace uh, provider to the exporter using the batch span processor. And this is again coming from the SDK. And then eventually once everything has been connected, all the pipelines are set, we just call the um, by fast API instrumentation so that like a, a, a API or the function is being instrumented to collect those tracing data. And once we run it, all these world values, whenever we send a request, will be called in the Jaeger dashboard. And we can see like every single request can be seen over here. And if you click on it, you will be able to see like, okay, so this request had a receive um, call, an HTTP call, and there is another send call and how much time it's taking and when it's starting up. And if you click on it, you'll also see like the detailed information, like what's the HTTP host, what's, the, oh, sorry, what's the uh, URL, what's the target, what's the port number which is being called, the peer IP and everything. So you, you get to see like where exactly the majority of the time was taken in my request. So this is like one part of it, like the tracing. And which brings us back to open telemetry, like it's not just traces, right? So if you see this uh, kind of a graphical representation, we see like there's a lot of information coming in from maybe microservices using our SDKs or something like a shared infrastructure from Kubernetes or proxies or cloud services like GCP, AWS. These values go to the hotel collector, which then exports it to your favorite choice of uh, front ends, maybe new relic you're using, Grafana, or whatever you're using. And if you try to use with the OTL with Prometheus, 
or Loki for your logs, your Grafana is for your dashboard, Tempo is for your traces, which is provided by OpenTelemetry, sorry, Grafana, and Prometheus is for your metrics. So you will see a dashboard like this. I mean, you can always uh, tweak those values because this is just your Grafana JSON values, whatever exactly the metrics you want to call. And here you'll see like a system called the expenses, which you have been calling since the start of the presentation. And it had like two exceptions and two calls were done. Both of them failed. And why they failed or why they passed, if you go to the next slide, we can see like, we can change the value, like what exactly is this value coming from? If it's the traces value coming from tempo, we can see, oh, there's a list of traces which happened in our, all the requests. We figured out, okay, this is the trace we are working with, and the trace has a specific unique ID. We click on it, we see, okay, these were the traces, and for example, here, this request passed. And uh, it's a, again a get request to the expenses. And if you want to see some logs, you can also uh, see them uh, by clicking on the log button, or you can just simply change the tempo to Loki, and you will be able to see like, okay, the logs which you were making initially in the applications can be now traced back to a specific trace ID. So we don't have to just like search for the log files and just say, like, or maybe if you're on a Linux or Linux system or something, you just tail it up. And yeah, so this is a much better approach when you're working with big microservices application. And similarly, you can also get the Prometheus data in the Prometheus dashboard. And yeah, that's pretty much it. This is how you can leverage your observability and debugging to code faster and better. Thank you. So I think we have a few more minutes. So if you have any questions. Can I ask your slide later? Uh, oh yeah, so, so I'm really sorry. I just have to create a link for this. So I'll create it and I'll just like send it to, you. I, I can just like, you can you guys, you guys can just like check my Twitter. I'll just like post it over there. Oh. I just like forgot to make a copy of it and just like add a URL for this. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, just one comment about, uh, there was one slide where you just make a joke of it. It's like uh, everybody uses debug print. So, so I found out yesterday there's something called ice cream. There, there's yes. something called ice cream, which is better than print F. Better than yeah. print, <laughs> yes. Not, you should still use a debugger, <laughs> but if you really have to, use ice cream instead of yeah, print. True, true, true. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, you mentioned profiling and covered pro various tools you can uh, use for that. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, profiling is something that uh, a software engineer should care about, or is that something that should come with the platform? Like uh, Grafana provides something like uh, Pyroscope, I believe, that does uh, continuous profiling on the servers, mm -hmm. and you can have your your flame graphs along with your metrics, traces, and logs in Grafana. But th those are happening in the production, right? Like when your app is in the production. Yes, that's true. But like we as a developer also have to take care of like the system or the, pro the functions which are being called are actually working before just like pushing them into production so that like the father can just pick it up and just like profile it for us. No more questions? All right then, thank you so much for joining guys. See you later.